The context for discovery of the pandas subgroup was that at the NIMH in the 1980s, Dr. Judy Rappaport, who was head of child psychiatry branch, and her colleague in London, Dr. Mike Rudder, were looking for a medical model of OCD. I find it incredibly ironic that it's been 25 years and parents are still being blamed for their kids' illness. I, I hear from families all the time where the moms are said, told, well, there's nothing wrong with your child, but if you don't get some help, there's going to be or other just uh, Munchausen's by proxy, all kinds of very concerning things about the fact that parents aren't being believed when they talk about what's happening to their kids. Well, they weren't in the 1980s either, only then it was like autism, the mom's fault. It's always our fault. <laughs> Even when it's genetics, it's somehow our fault, right? It takes two genes to make the problem, but it was the moms that made it. And it's the moms that fix it. Thank you, Maggie. All right, now the poor fathers who are in the room. You help. So at that time, it was punitive toilet training and harsh parenting practices. And it was really quite ironic because Freud himself had described OCD as a biologic illness, a neurologic illness that was different from the other things. But it had been constructed and construed as an, a neurotic illness and so they were looking for medical models. And we went to Minnesota to look at Sagawa's dystonia, <laughs> went to Pennsylvania to look at other families, and literally were going down a very long list of illnesses that affected the basal ganglia. And Sydenham's chorea became our choice. Sydenham's chorea, from the earliest descriptions, had been described with perseverativeness of behavior, and very importantly for the pandas concept, emotional ability, personality changes, and many, many of the symptoms that we now have described in the PANDAS cohort. In the 1950s and 60s, there were retrospective and prospective studies documenting the relationship of obsessive compulsive symptoms to Sydenham's chorea. And we did two studies at the NIMH documenting that up to three quarters of children with Sydenham chorea had obsessive compulsive symptoms. Interestingly, the symptoms started two to four weeks before the chorea began, indicating that this could be a form fruit of the illness. And in the early days, it wasn't actually controversial as long, at all, as long as we stuck with Sydenham's chorea, because that was well accepted to be a post-streptococcal illness and one of the manifestations of rheumatic fever. But uh, Dr. Louise Kiesling here in Providence ha was a pioneer and our hero. Is she here? <gasps> Dr. Kiesling's here too. Dr. Kiesling actually wrote one of the very first papers making this connection, so she's really the hero of the day. <laughs> she made the very prescient observation that this was happening in children with primary presentation of tics, as well as with OCD, and that these kids had antineuronal antibodies. And in a study uh, replicating what John Husby had done in the 1970s, we were able to actually document that the antibodies were raised against the strep bacteria and then misrecognized the basal ganglia. So we've talked about this as an autoimmune illness. I'm gonna change that to something that's much more correct. It's a misdirected immune response. And when we think about it that way, that makes sense why the treatments that we use would be appropriate. Our very first case is actually the, uh, the true person who discovers, discovered pandas, and that was a mom who was a medical technologist and had three sons, the youngest of whom was sent to us in our Sydenham's Korea study because he had these wild dance-like movements. But every time he did them, they were exactly the same. And Dr. Gold and uh, others know that, that Sydenham's chorea is characterized by the fact that you can't predict the movements. It's called St. Vitus's dance because every time you do a voluntary movement, then it sets off a cascade of involuntary movements. And the kids kind of dance and flop about, and at the end I'm going to show you a video of what that looks like. But in this case, the child's movements weren't random and involuntary. They were actually quite specific, and it turned out that he was doing a ritual every time he got a bad thought. He also had a diagnosis coming into us of dysarthria because he was talking like this. Well, he was talking like that because his mouth was full of spit. Sorry, I hate spit. <laughs> Saliva. <laughs> and 
he would, had a hoarding obsession, and so he couldn't let anything go that had been part of him, including his saliva, and he would hold it in his mouth until he could spit into a cup. That history had not been elicited despite going to three neurologists before he came to us, and so we had three neurologists examine him at the NIH just to make sure we hadn't missed any chorea, because as you may know better than I, Sydenham chorea has a very specific treatment plan, and it is a rule out for, for pandas. So if all else fails, start talking about Sydenham's chorea for your child, and they will get antibiotic prophylaxis, they can even get uh, plasmapheresis and IVIG, but they do need to have chorea. And that's been our argument for the last few years, is we can't change the definition of Sydenham's to include pandas because the fact the pandas is a rule out. So he was strep positive at the NIMH, and just antibiotics and tincture of time resolved his symptoms. As they do for all children with pandas, it's a semi-acute illness like Sydenham's chorea. It will go away by itself, but I don't believe that we should be asking kids to wait one, two, three years for that to be gone, particularly if they have an intercurrent infection and it makes things flare again. So that's, again, a point that actually Dr. Gilbert and I were able to agree on at the American Academy of Pediatrics meeting. <laughs> so we are um, at this point, you're thinking, wait, she said the mom discovered this. Well, this was her youngest son. Her oldest son had a diagnosis of Tourette syndrome and she was a medical technologist, as I told you, and the family joke was every time his tics got bad, it was time to bring home a culturette and have mom swab his throat and played it out when she went back to work the next day. Because if they waited another two or three days, he would have a rip roar and strep pharyngitis and he would have to miss school. So she had already made this connection, as Dr. Kiesling had, that strep could trigger the tics. Well, that child, 150 kids that we were following in drug treatment trial, and then uh, 50 children that we recruited just by asking for children with an acute onset of their symptoms became the group of patients on which the PANDA's clinical uh, manifestations were based. And Dr. Miro Kovacevic told, us, told me that our paper was great and we should have just left it at the clinical description and not written those, quote, damn criteria. <laughs> because if we had left it at that, maybe people would be more um, opening and welcoming. Dinah says maybe not, but we'll move ahead. Who knows? Who knows? The crucial factor here is the fact that it's the acuity of onset. And for any of you who are in the room who think your child has pandas and you can't remember the day, possibly the hour that the symptoms started, you might not actually have a child with pandas. And we would be happy to talk with you about that because one of the things we've learned over the last 25 years is if it's not pandas and you treat it like it is, it's not going to help. In fact, Dr. Rappaport and I did a study using plasmapheresis for garden variety OCD, fully expected that because it had been so effective in the kids with pandas that it would help those children. They had not one speck of response. So you're wasting time and money and most importantly, going down the wrong path if it isn't pandas. All right, enough lecturing. We heard the new statistics, so I'm not gonna go into much detail, except to say that this was a research subgroup. It was a clinical presentation that differed from the larger uh, group of children with OCD and tics. We don't know how common it is. Dr. Rappaport thinks that it may be as many as half of the kids who have a prepubertal onset of symptoms belong in the PANDAS group. I think it's probably not that common, but at the very least, it's fair to say that not all children with OCD and tics are in the PANDAS cohort. And most specifically, by the time you meet criteria for Tourette's disorder, which is the group of children that were studied by Curlin and his colleagues, even if you had been a PANDAS, it's going to be very difficult to reconstruct that because of the generalization of the immune response. So if you wait until it's a year, two years out, you're not going to know what was happening at the very early onset of symptoms. The comorbidity, again, I don't have to tell you, this is the rule, not the exception. And in fact, in the new PANS criteria, it actually is the rule that you can't have just the onset of OCD. You have to have other things happening at the same time. ADHD, behavior change, the emotional ability that was present in 95% of children with Sydenham's chorea is definitely present in these patients as well. And during acute exacerbations, chorea form movements has the same beginning name as chorea, but they're very different. They're only present on the stress neurologic exam. And Dr. Sondergold was just as good as her husband 
Is that fair to say? Yes, it is, because it's true. In making the differentiation of Korea form movements from dancing Korea. So it's very possible for the physicians to do. We're just in the final stages of finally getting that paper together and with the videos so that we can begin to instruct physicians on how to make that distinction. The other pieces are separation anxiety, very abrupt on overnight onset of kids who can't leave their parents' side, or in many cases can't leave the home, that it's almost an agoraphobic picture where the child is unable to leave the house for fear. And in our ca uh, early cases, we only found 20% of the children with enuresis, but in Dr. Kovacevic's sample, and I think in our subsequent IVIG trial, it's at least three quarters, if not uh, closer to 80% of the children have urinary symptoms. Huge, huge, wonderful, wonderful symptom to focus on with your pediatrician. Ask them to do a workup for a urinary tract infection. When it's negative, ask them to then go ahead and look at a throat culture. Urinary frequency, urgency, and the kids describe sort of they've just urinated and they feel like they have to go immediately again. It's a very classic symptom. It may actually provide us with some new uh, ways to think about treatment. And then the short-term memory problems. There is some evidence from Sydenham's Korea that the short-term memory problems, particularly the uh, deterioration in math skills and the visual spatial skills, it could be somewhat chronic. But even in our kids who had the worst Sydenham's Korea, in large part, they were doing extraordinarily well at follow-up, and they were only found on neuropsych testing. So if your child's grades have sort of tanked during this episode, no concerns. They should come back up. Behavioral regression is a huge symptom, and it's fr frankly fascinating to me as a pediatrician um, to watch these little macho 10 and 11-year-old boys suddenly start talking baby talk and wanting to play with baby toys. Um, it's a little frightening when you're the parent of that child. But here's a picture um, that was drawn during an acute episode of illness in June of 2006, and this is the picture that the child drew three months later. So that behavioral regression is not just in the behaviors they're exhibiting, but also actually in their motoric function and their, um, and she was actually 10, not the three-year-old it looks like on that left panel. So as I've already told you, and I'm gonna tell you three more times before I'm done, please, please, please don't stretch the criteria to fit your child. They were made to distinguish a group of children who had a, a similar etiology from everybody else. We already know that everybody else probably has many, many different etiologies, including genetics and other environmental factors, and we'll talk a minute about PANS, but if they don't have an acute onset, you're not thinking PANS or PANDAS, and if they don't meet the criteria, then they get into studies by uh, the, the PANDAS critics, but more importantly, they're just a child with pandas, like my little grandson. In pink are the things that became controversial, and I'm not going to dwell on these because we don't have enough time, but I just, um, again, if we could live our lives over, I would absolutely have listened to Dr. Rappaport and not talked about ticks, even though Dr. Kiesling and I knew how important it was. Uh, Dr. Rappaport had said if you put the ticks in, then the neurologists are going to have a a say in this and you're going to be very sad and it's turned out to be true. However, the ticks were crucial in our early studies because that was something that was observable. It had been recorded in the medical record and we were able to take and correlate times when the child was having tick uh, flares, go back and look at their journals and see the difference in handwriting samples. Then we could also correlate those with their antistreptococcal titers and that's how we made the connection that every exacerbation is either triggered by a strep or after it generalizes by another uh, infectious or immune stimulating trigger. The temporal relationship has also been a source of frustration as well as controversy and that's simply because uh, as we were writing the criteria, we were trying to just keep it as similar to Sydenham's Korea as possible. And in Sydenham's, there can be a five to nine month lag time between the onset of the illness and the preceding strep infection. So if you have that kind of lag, it could be at any point in time. Fortunately for us, we now know that children who are in at least their second episode and many times in their first episode, like our index case, will have a positive throat culture at presentation. And that had been documented just not by our group, but by a number of other groups. And that's why one of our recommendations is acute behavioral change, do an adequate throat culture, 
all the way back into the oropharynx and get a really good swab, culture it overnight, not just a rapid strip, and then treat when positive. This picture is shown so I can remember to talk to you about titers. I still am getting uh, emails from folks who are chasing titers. You can chase them for the rest of your life and you will spend a lot of money and it won't help your child one speck. A titer, and Dr. Cunningham is gonna talk to you much more about this this afternoon, so you don't have to hear anything except don't get them unless it's a, an acute onset and you can get a, rest, um, a baseline and then see a titer rise because it's only a rise in titers that indicates the child has an infection at that point in time. If they're high, they can stay high. And one of the children in my uh, first trial, they were falling longitudinally, had a titer of one to 3,000 on both ASO and anti-DNA speed, the highest that our lab will record for two and a half years. No infections in that intervening time. So if you're waiting for the titer to come down, it's not gonna help you. And they're only secondary markers. The ASO, the anti-strep DNA B are not doing your child any harm at all. In this picture, the child on the top has a PANDAS infection, but the red line is the Yale-Brown obsessive compulsive symptom scale. And if you could make it go straight up, that's what it should have been, just an overnight onset. And notice the black line, which is the ASO titer, actually goes up six weeks later. That's what you want to see. You want to see the titer low and then rise after six to eight weeks and then come down, and then they have a second episode. In the non-PANDAS child shown at the bottom, they also, she, she or he also had two infections shown there by two rises in the ASO titer, but notice that the symptoms are just sort of randomly associated with that. And I bet you that what would happen in many practices is you draw a titer there at month five in that non-PANDAS patient, the titer would be high, the symptoms would be high, but it would actually be, have been higher in the months preceding. So again, following titers is only useful if you can catch it at that initial, at the time of infection, and follow it forward. The second thing about strep uh, that made it really problematic is the fact that it is absolutely epidemic. 65 to 75% of children will have a strep infection in the school year. This means that the normal, quote unquote normal, titer is 440. That's still a positive titer, but it means that on a community basis, your chances of finding a positive titer are very high, number one. And number two, the chances of a child having had a strep and then having an onset of OCD, and those two things just being by chance, sort of what we call a true, true, unrelated. So it's true they had a strep, it's true they got OCD and ticks, but the two just happen by chance alone. That's gonna be hap true one in 12 cases. So again, just finding the relationship isn't enough. You have to meet the clinical presentation first of acute onset. And the second criticism is one that I think is actually spurious. It's just a, something to throw out to make themselves sound like they know what they're talking about. <laughs> and, but you may have heard it. And that is the fact that when they find the throat culture in an asymp supposedly asymptomatic child, Right? They don't have a sore throat, they don't have fever or headache and stomach ache, but unfortunately many, many pediatricians don't know that a lot of strep infections present with headache or stomach ache and some low-grade fever rather than a sore throat. In those kids who are just cultured, 80 to 5 to 90 percent of those represent an asymptomatic infection, but anywhere between 5 and 15 percent are carriers. Now carriers are kids who have the strep just living in their throat perfectly happily because it doesn't actually invade and it doesn't set off an immune response. So by definition, it could not be a cause of pandas because it's not possible then to have a post-immune response, post-infectious immune response. However, that child is sort of the typhoid Mary of the classroom because they just give it to everybody else. <laughs> but if it's one of your kids in your home, <laughs> is particularly bad, and we talk with families all the time about sort of the risk-benefit ratio of trying to eradicate that strep, particularly if it's in a sibling or classmate versus uh, continued exposure to the child with pandas. And we are happy to help think of your uh, physicians to think about that because we've now had one case in which trying to eradicate strep in the entire household, a father got C. difficile and became very sick. So. Indiscriminate use of antibiotics is, is very scary for many, many, many reasons, but the most real to all of us in this room is the fact that we don't want any do any harm 
to our kids with pandas or their family members by overuse of antibiotics. So there are other strategies that can be tried and, and we can work through those. Okay, so these negative studies for 10 years, there were negative studies, are actually, we just counted again, more negative editorials than negative data papers, uh, but they had a very profound effect and it really truly created a, a controversy. I still put it in quotation marks because it was contrived, it's not real. Um, but can they negate clinical observations? I actually won the debate in uh, Orlando. Sorry, don't clap. No. I was just going to tell you about my trick because, because fortunately the, the neurologist that had framed the question, it wasn't Dr. Gilbert, uh, had given me the advantage. He had, the question was, is strep associated with OCD uh, and ticks? And they assumed the answer was no. And so in my first three slides, I'm, I told you what I've already told them, what I've already told you, and that is how OCD is related to Sydenham's chorea. Sydenham's chorea, even Dr. Gilbert had written, was a post-streptococcal illness. And by the third slide, I could declare victory. <laughs> but in the rebuttal, I had five minutes to rebut their 10 years of negative data. So my research assistant drew this wonderful picture of why the negative studies couldn't really prove that pandas didn't exist because they were looking at the wrong patients with the wrong methods and the wrong bugs. <laughs> and I'm just showing you this because I, I find it um, completely emblematic of the lengths that the neurology community has gone to to disprove pandas. This study was published in Neurology with an editorial by Gilbert and Curlin claiming it had a rigorous methodology and was uh, definitive negative proof. And it used streptococcal infections everywhere. You have to go to a password protected website that I had to get one of my neurology colleagues to get me into because I could not to find that this table was actually the diagnoses that were used. And you probably can't read it. The ones in red are actually something to do with strep that could cause pandas. Everything else is completely irrelevant and includes healthy tonsils, uh, non-strep bacterial pharyngitis, viral sore throat, and my very favorite in the green, pyoderma chancroforme, which is syphilis. <laughs> so I don't think any of their patients actually had syphilis, but that was the lengths that they went to to show that there was no relationship. And despite that and not having any of their patients meet the PANDAS criteria, they still found a relationship between strep and symptom exacerbations. This is a reminder that we knew from the very beginning strep wasn't the only thing that could cause this. And again, there's another great take home message. If you don't find strep, that doesn't mean it wasn't an infectious trigger. It just makes it a little bit harder to figure out what you're gonna treat. And I think we'll hear more um, certainly later today and tomorrow about that. We have documented acute onset OCD following in our original report Chickenpox, influenza, more recently the H1N1 influenza outbreak had a tremendous amount of pans associated with it, and also with mycoplasma and Lyme disease. And as we heard in the survey this morning, there are certainly a lot of families concerned about that in this room. So in an effort to meet the neurologist halfway, we agreed to get rid of the etiology in the description. Let's just focus on the clinical presentation and try to get these kids at least an appropriate medical workup. We went into the meeting in July 2010 with that as our agreed upon outcome. We worked for two days and we actually did develop clinical criteria for what is now known as either PANS or CANS, but basically acute onset of neuropsychiatric symptomatology. A child who's been doing well, maybe they had a little ADHD, maybe they were a little bit anxious, maybe they were a little bit normal before, and then they fall off the wagon, they just fall off the, um, curve and they become a child with pandas or pans. The vote at the end of the meeting was 38 to 3 that it would be pans, pediatric acute onset neuropsychiatric syndrome, in large part because we were actually trying to make sure that we didn't have this false uh, demarcation at puberty. We wanted to include pediatric, which goes up, according to Jay Gee, to age 24, 25. That's also when the car rental companies think that you're an adult. <laughs> so that seemed to make good sense. Whereas childhood is very much re uh, constrained to the pre-adolescent years. However, the three neurologists that voted for CANS, Childhood Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, held up our paper so that they could get theirs published first, and it actually made the controversy worse. So 
I'm not going to apologize for that one because we didn't do anything wrong that time. Um, and it really made it clear that there are some people who are deeply invested in this not getting recognition. And so one of the things we're so grateful for having this meeting and also all of your parents is that it's really making a difference one physician at a time. If we can educate every single physician, we can make a big difference. Thank you. And frankly, the other thing that's making a huge difference for us is the number of physicians' families who have been affected by PANS and PANDAS. So it's, it's working both ways. For the PANS group, forget etiology. All you have to care about is the acute, acuity of onset and the fact that it isn't just OCD, but that they need to have two of the other seven categories. And the other thing that's really interesting to me, and if I had been an editor at Journal of Pediatrics, I probably would have raised an eyebrow when a paper by five neurologists was published that only talked about OCD and behavior problems because ticks is not anywhere in the PANS or CANS definition. So the expected presentation is an acute, foudroyant, or lightning-like episode, and I give Paul Grant credit, although I understand that other people had already talked about that. It's from the French for lightning-like, and it's the perfect description of the onset of this illness. OCD or an eating disorder, and I'll t show you in a minute the kinds of symptoms that you can get as part of the anorexia picture, but they need to have separation anxiety or other anxiety symptoms. The dilated pupils and the fight or flight reaction that so many of our kids get, hypervigilance and hyperarousal. Emotional ability and irritability, laughing, crying, screaming for no good reason. Behavioral regression, I've already showed you examples in the urinary frequency we've talked about. <coughs> Academic difficulties, and that final category is motoric or sensory abnormalities. These are the kids who are acutely unable to wear clothes because of waistbands or other problems. The eating disorders, very rare, but everybody who has a, a vested interest in this or has seen these patients is very comfortable agreeing that this is a medical emergency. There are two categories of medical emergency, and when we get to treatment and talk about sort of urgent, life-threatening situations, one of them is a child who is now refusing to eat, either because they have scrupulosity concerns, they feel guilty, they're not worthy of eating, fear of choking, fear of vomiting, fear of... Um, contamination. Once they lose 10% of their body weight, they're not going to be able to eat anymore. But we've actually seen patients with Sydenham's chorea who acutely developed body image distortions and stopped eating to try and get skinny. Both of those conditions need intervention, preferably with an immunomodulatory treatment. The second thing, second source of emergency is the children who have life-threatening behaviors. They have the impulsivity, irritability, and they're trying to jump out of a moving car, jump off of roofs, many horrible, horrible study stories, or the child who has um, suicidal ideation and at the same time has a loss of impulsivity and you've removed the knives from the house, you know, safe, child-proofed the house to the extent possible and you're still not able to sleep at night for fear that they'll get up and do something. Those kids need to be in a hospital with some very aggressive therapy. So the whole point of this research subgroup was to have a very narrow group with a homogeneous onset so we could learn more about the brain in OCD and ticks. And this is the model that had been used in Sydenham's Korea, and it makes good sense. About six to t 10 strep out of the 120 some strains can produce rheumatic fever. We think it's probably that few in pandas as well. So it isn't every strep infection, it's only those who have these antigens on the cell wall that look like the human host. Genetic susceptibility is huge. Only 3% of the population is susceptible to rheumatic fever. I think it's probably about 3% of the population that might be susceptible to pandas. And the reason for that is that they don't actually make antibodies against the conserved portion of the strep. So they never develop strep immunity. They just continue to get strep infections with ever finer uh, antibody production. Leads to a misdirected immune response through molecular mimicry. These are the three lines of evidence that convinced uh, physicians that Sydenham's chorea was a post-streptococcal illness. Clinical observations in epidemiologic studies, mostly done in the 1940s among military recruits. The fact that antibiotic prophylaxis is so effective in preventing recrudescences and the production of these cross-reactive antibodies. Many of the, the last studies uh, were done by Dr. Cunningham using samples from NIMH and other places. 
In pandas, we actually have two additional lines of evidence that strep is related, and we're going to go through very quickly what this evidence is. The first is the clinical observations. The fact that there's a very strong correlation in timing between months in which strep is ubiquitous in the classrooms and periods when children are having observable ticks and behavior problems. And this was a study we did in Northern Virginia uh, over the course of a school year. And notice how many kids have ticks. As many as 10% during winter months will have ticks that are only present for a month or two. So the frequency of pandas may actually, or at least post-streptococcal tick disorders, may be quite high. And it's just the unlucky child that ends up with the full blown <coughs> picture. Tanya Murphy was able to get into the classrooms uh, and actually into the school where they were doing surveillance throat cultures to prevent rheumatic fever in a migrant um, a worker population. And in that study, she beautifully demonstrated that if the child had an asymptomatic strep, a positive throat culture without other symptoms, they had these tics, choreiform movements present, as well as hyperactivity and other behavioral problems. Notice the last line there, that the more strep infections they had during the school year, the more likely they were to have this behavior. We had seen the same thing in Sao Paulo, Brazil, where they had inadequate prophylaxis, where when individuals have multiple episodes of Sydenham's chorea, the risk of OCD goes from 65 to 70 percent all the way up to 100 percent. Treatment of strep reduces those exacerbations. This study I will make sure is in your packet as well as your physician's packet. It has never been refuted and it was complete clinical observations in a pediatric practice in Rochester, New York. But because of the way PubMed and the internet works, nobody looks beyond the last three to five years for research and this is now more than a decade old. It documented that if you do a throat culture on a child presenting with behavioral problems, including urinary symptoms, and the throat culture is positive, treat it, Eight out of the 12 children had complete remission of their OCD symptoms. So this is the strongest evidence you can show your pediatricians to say, just do the throat culture. <laughs> Swab the throat, treat it if it's positive, and in, in the majority of cases, that's going to be enough. For that episode, the next time it happens, you have to do it again. Third line of evidence was uh, prophylaxis. This had been very effective in rheumatic fever, and the theory is that if the OCD and ticks are sequelae of a strep infection, then if you prevent the strep, you could prevent the exacerbations. And it's indeed true. In our second antibiotic trial, we used azithromycin or penicillin as prophylactic agents and completely obliterated strep in this population of children, 22 kids participating in a year-long study, and reduced the number of exacerbations they had from two per year down to about 0.78 on average which was interestingly the same rate as Curlin had reported in his study, and he claimed that was evidence there was no relationship. What he didn't uh, make clear to folks was that the methods in that study, the reason it was the wrong methods, were that they did monthly throat cultures, and every positive culture was reported to the child's pediatrician who had an obligation to treat. That had been shown in 1950 by Floyd Denny and his colleagues in rheumatic fever to be an incredibly effective strategy for prevention of recurrences of rheumatic fever, monthly throat cultures and treatment when positive. So they basically did a prophylaxis study within their supposed natural history study. In this trial, what was really clear was that the kids were doing a lot better on antibiotics than when they were off. And again, I think this evidence has not been refuted and would be strong enough evidence to continue kids on antibiotic prophylaxis and get asked all the time, when can they come off? And the answer is, it totally depends. The earliest would be a year after their last flare. More often is going to be through adolescence. If they go off to college, they're living in a dorm, they're in a military recruit, you put them back on antibiotics because that's where those rheumatic fever studies were done. The most recent American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines for rheumatic heart disease are that they continue antibiotic prophylaxis long term, i.e. lifelong. I don't think that's true for our kids with pandas. There's some good evidence that they do outgrow their susceptibility to this illness and that once they get through adolescence, they're not going to have trouble. So it really is a matter of min minimizing symptom-free months when they're young with the knowledge that even if you didn't, they're going to do better, they're going to do fine in the long term. But you don't want to wait that long, so you do it while they're ill. Cross-reactive antibodies, 
All I'm going to show you is that Madeline will be talking about this later this afternoon, but I do want to thank her for her amazing work in this area because I think it's the most definitive, including a study that she uh, took the lead with a group in Israel that provided one of our two animal models of pandas. And to be honest, this was what won the debate because in uh, Mady Hornig's group in Columbia University, they actually were able to take serum from our children with Sydenham's chorea or with pandas and evoked the same behavioral response in the little mice. He just backflips. He was incredibly hyperactive and had this repetitive backflipping behavior. Can you see <laughs> your child? <laughs> can, you, can you see his cage mate sort of standing behind the thing going, what is, on earth is this stupid mouse doing? But it, in that study, they could evoke exactly the same behavior in another group of mice by taking the serum out of those affected mice and transferring it into naive mice. Dr. Cunningham and her colleagues in Israel actually started with the strep, infected the animals, demonstrated two things. One, that antipsychotics and, and SSRIs that would be used for humans to treat the symptoms were effective in treating that behavioral abnormality in those animals, and secondly, that when the animals were sacrificed, that the area that had the inflammation was exactly where we had predicted in the caudate, in the uh, putamen, in the striatum in those animals. So let's talk about abnormal immune response. This is the piece that we have focused on again more recently in a trial that we're doing at Yale, looking at the effectiveness of IVIG therapy. This study should have been the definitive one because there is a huge difference in the effects of on the left side, IVIG at baseline and at one month ratings. In the middle is placebo, absolutely no difference in effectiveness. And on the right side, plasmapheresis. I just want you to remember that this, these are invasive therapies. IVIG has risks. Plasmapheresis has fewer risks, but it's a bigger deal to get it done. And in both cases, you want to make sure that it's necessary for your child. And I would say that we, you should probably use the same limitations that we did at the NIMH in Yale, and that was that the child was severely ill. They are mul affected in multiple domains. Their OCD is bad enough that they're spending hours a day. In most of our kids, they weren't able to get to school anymore. I've heard about some of the kids who are either brave enough or in behavior therapy programs where they are getting to school, but it's a daily struggle. Those are the kinds of kids you would think about IVIG. If your child has some OCD, some tics, there are many other things that we can use before we have to go here. This is the change that you can uh, uh, produce in caudate volume in one of our kids who had came into us with 100% of his waking hours, actually 95% of his waking hours, just with obsessional worries that something bad was going to happen to his parents, symmetry concerns. He was a gymnast and he had done uh, rings, so he had done a lot of physical training and he developed symmetry concerns, which required him to try and do 10 left 10 right-handed push-ups, exactly the same as 10 left-handed push-ups, and he would just get stuck in these rituals for hours at a time. My, B, my research assistant and I actually had to hold his arms still because he did do these all these isometric exercises all the time, so we sat there with him for all of his plasma exchange procedures, and I honestly thought that when he was getting better, it was because we were doing such intensive behavior therapy, literally doing <laughs> holding him. That was the ultimate in exposure with response prevention, which I have two therapists holding you down. But it, I don't think we could have changed the size of his caudate. Before treatment, 20% enlargement, indicating acute inflammation. Following treatment had returned to normal. And Harry Shigani has now replicated these findings using PET in Michigan and documenting that IVIG can also normalize what he saw as inflammatory changes. So I'm going to close by just giving you five clinical slides. Use the diagnostic criteria. Medical workup, look for strep. Very simple, but get the adequate throat culture. Tanya Murphy tells, was taught that you have to draw blood. I was taught that you have to be in fear of having your clothes be ruined by somebody throwing up. But the bottom line is it's in the back, behind the uvula, at the, ba at the very top of the oropharynx, where it joins the nasopharynx. And if the nurse or tech is just sort of swabbing the back of the mouth, you know, the tongue or the tonsils, and the kid's kind of <laughs> that is not an adequate culture. Look for choreiform movements. Make sure you look for chorea and rule out Sydenhams. If you have Sydenhams, you have a, a wonderful 
well-known and accepted tr uh, treatment plan. Blood, I said that you should not draw titers unless you have an acutely ill child. If you do have an acute illness, particularly if the throat culture is positive, you want to make sure it wasn't just a carrier, you could do titers. Anti-nuclear antibodies, which is the test that's used to diagnose lupus and many, many other things. Non-specific test in medicine ends up being useful in pandas. Well, it may be ironic, but it actually is quite helpful. Over 55% of our kids have positive ANAs, and that's well recognized as a marker of autoimmunity. Dr. Cunningham's titers you're going to hear about later. And other labs really keep them to a minimum because this is a clinical diagnosis and not a lab diagnosis at this point in time. But you do need to rule out a variety of conditions, which are listed in the PANS paper. And then management. We don't yet know how effective NSAIDs are. Uh, I talked with Mark Pasternak, Mass General, and he and I, I think we're going to do a, a reasonably sized trial of aspirin because aspirin was the only one of the uh, NSAIDs that was effective in reducing the fever of rheumatic fever. Ibuprofen and naproxen doesn't touch it. Antihistamines, families have told me this is effective. Um, certainly, if you use some Benadryl at nighttime for the kids are having trouble sleeping, you're killing two birds with one stone. Consider a short course of steroids, and I'll let Dr. Latimer talk much more about that. IVIG for those severe disabling cases, and at least IVIG, possibly plasmapheresis for the life-threatening ones. And the reason we prefer plasmapheresis was not only did you see that it was 65% reduction in symptoms in the plasma exchange group, but it actually pulls those antibody, circulating antibodies out and as many other immune factors. But more importantly, it's really fast. The kids are getting better as you go through the treatments, and we'll let Dr. Latimer talk about her experience with that. A refeeding protocol for those with eating problems, and then finally, most importantly for what I'm telling you today, after you've figured out the etiology, treat it as if it is what it is. Remember, this is a subgroup of children with OCD. So you can use cognitive behavior therapy. You can use medications. SSRIs have a bad rap on the blogs. I can tell you from my experience over the last 25 years, they can be extraordinarily helpful. You have to start incredibly low, like 1 20th of the usual dose, and taper up incredibly slowly over a period of weeks. Obviously, during that time, the child's not getting a lot of benefit, but you're not doing harm. Start low, go slow. As soon as the child can tolerate it, get them into a good cognitive behavior therapy program, because this illness is going to come back. And if they've got the tools in their toolkit, they can just nip it in the bud, and it's incredibly effective. One of the things um, we can talk about tomorrow in the panel discussion is just helping draw a picture for them of how big the brain is and how small the caudate and the putamen, and the affected regions are, and how they got 99% of their brain able to uh, fight off the bad OCD. Additional therapies, as symptoms indicate, we actually are doing sleep studies now, and it looks like by the time uh, six months from now, maybe, we'll be able to give you some good advice on how to deal with the sleep difficulties. But they actually have abnormal sleep studies. So if you're dealing with a physician who's, who's sort of on the fence about your child's illness, an overnight EEG with polysomnography may be very useful. In about 15% uh, of the cases, the EEG is showing evidence of encephalopathic changes, which is indication for immunomodulatory therapies. And in about 80% of the cases, they're having sleep abnormalities um, that are quite profound. And the medications to treat those sleep abnormalities are well accepted in the community. So I would just want to thank my colleagues and collaborators and thank all of you for getting us back into this mess after a period of being away. Thank you.